Faculty of Arts and Creative Industries in the University of Sunderland. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here and to welcome you all to this talk. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to, to be here as part of the launch event for Copy That, Surplus Data in the Age of Repetitive Duplication, part of the Data as Culture programme here at the ODI. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to congratulate Hannah and the artists who are involved in the exhibition and the team here at the ODI for um, providing us such a, such a compelling exhibition, which is going to be opening later on, uh, and kind of weaving interesting provocations and discussions and artworks throughout the fabric of this space, this office space. Um, experiences that will no doubt resonate with, through, with us throughout a rather interesting 2020. So, I'm just going to press start on this. I'm going to have to be quite tight with the time. Um, and so all of the all the speakers know that the idea and the format is going to be that I'm going to give a brief introduction, and each of the speakers are going to have a few minutes to talk about their chapter before opening it up to a more conversational piece where we'll kind of have some questions and we'll open it out to the floor. So while people are talking, do have a think about any kind of questions that you might want to ask a little bit, a little bit, a little bit later. So given the deeply collaborative distributed nature of the Data as Culture programme, we felt that the ODI uh, would be a really fitting location for the official UK launch of our book, Art Act Practice, Critical Intersections of um, Art, Innovation and the Maker Movement. I've just dropped the clicker. Um, <laughs> so I've co-edited this book with my colleague, Dr. Victoria Bradbury, who couldn't join us today, sadly, um, but sends her warmth and wishes from Asheville in North Carolina, where she's based. Over the last three years, uh, Victoria and I have been engaged in a similarly collaborative and distributed process that's seen us reach out to artists, curators, designers, historians and thinkers from around the world, creative and cultural producers and um, who are working at those blurring edges of critical and interdisciplinary practices that combine arts, technology and making. So we wanted to bring those voices together as a body of contemporary practice that could be acknowledged and further understood by fellow practitioners, by academics, critics and students who also need to find new ways to respond to the rapid, rapid evolution of new contexts, agendas and ways of working um, and find strategies for levering these to develop and produce artworks um, that they wish to accomplish and put out, push out into the world. So we're really grateful to the, each of the 24 authors who spent, uh, who together represent 11 countries over five continents. Um, and the conversations that we had with these talented people really shaped what this book would become. Um, so we thought it was really fitting to kind of, you know, frame this launch event as a discussion, essentially. Um, and so I'm really delighted to welcome three of our contributing authors. Uh, to the panel this evening, Mark Garrett from Furtherfield, Irini Papadimitriou, um, Artistic Director of Future Everything, and of course, Hannah radler Hawes, who's <laughs> curator of um, the Data as Culture programme here at the ODI. And so to the panel, what is art hacking? So art hacking is a term that seeks to describe ever emerging models of collaboration um, that have become increasingly possible as pervasive technologies continue to dissolve those traditional boundaries between art, innovation and society. And as the creative economy continues to shape both cultural and corporate policy across the globe, the economic poss possibilities inherent within DIY and the make the DIY culture and the maker movement has garnered significant attention, as we all know, catapulting hacking and making and the spaces that they occur in into a front and centre position. So through our book and through the panel today, we hope to refocus attention from maker culture as an economic resource for commercial ventures and highlight those artists and curators who open up dialogues for a more critical understanding. Um, of the implications of how technologies are being created and shaping our world, particularly focusing on their human impact. So through our process, we brought together exemplars that challenge perceived distinctions between the arts and um, economic, artistic and economic production by broking new and direct ways of working between them. Um, challenging traditional understanding uh, of the role of artists in society. So 
The book and the panel offer an understanding of the many strands and characteristics of arts and maker strategies as viewed through our contributors' practices. And each panelist, as I said, will give a short presentation followed by discussion. So, can you please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Mark Garrett. Okay, so we've got a space in Finsbury Park. We've got two spaces in Finsbury Park. Hmm? Two spaces in Finsbury Park. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we've got two spaces in Finsbury Park. One is a gallery and one is a common space where we do workshops and we work with local people around the area. There's about, oh, I'd say about 80 different languages around Finsbury Park with uh, different cultures that we work with. And we've been going since 96 so and in the way we, even before then we were involved in Bristol with pirate radio pirate television and so we're kind of hacking cultures so as a very natural thing to do it wasn't because we, we needed to do it so uh, in a sense about creating your own culture building your own context on your own terms rather than having kind of a narrative given to you from top down and so in a sense that's what we kind of uh, are still doing in some ways with lots of different people and uh, and hacking so what hacking means to us is very much is about hack value rather than just so that there's lots of different reasons why you hack rather than and not to do it just for the sake of it uh, same as not using technology just for the sake of it and uh, so the article we gave was called Daiwo which means do it with others and Dawo, which I've forgotten what it means now. <laughs> Distributed auto, auto autonomous organisation with others. That's what it means. <laughs> and uh, but the most important thing is uh, with Dawo, it's it's post do do it yourself. So it's very much about working with other people on kind of grassroots culture and kind of technology recycled and reused. Then unlocking proprietary systems. It's very much that's very much about working with different classes and different genders, uh, intersectional cultures where people don't normally, are not normally educated in technology, where you're breaking down kinds of social contexts. And also in the proprietorial, other than proprietary, psychologically, if you look in dictionary, it means his hand on her shoulder. It's very much a kind of like patriarchal dominance. And then you've got uh, from proprietary to proprietary systems, uh, which is in the book, and then you've got Daiwo to Daiwo, decentralised autonomous organisation with others. And that's kind of like the sub-chapters of the book, which we haven't got time to go into, which you can read and ask questions. Uh, I'm just going to show you this one here. So th this is really just to explain more what Daiwo is, and it's very much uh, a kind of, I don't know if many people are familiar with net art, but net art traditionally is very much about rhizomatic networks where people connect on a, on a kind of flat distribution. And uh, we've kind of liked the idea of that, but we've always liked the idea of assemblages. So we've got an assemblage here, and that's all the different kind of things that are part of that assemblage so you can function and make something different happen in the culture that you're part of. So, as you can see, you, you use a USB stick, uh, social grouping, the philosopher, GNU Linux, because we're free and open source, Bitcoin, that's just an example. We use lots of different cryptocurrencies. So you've got all these, all these different things. And I think we've, oh yeah, Ruth put a dildo down there. <laughs> so, uh, and Ruth co-wrote the essay. So all these different things, that's a do Dogecoin. And so it's about all the tools that you'll be using in all different cultures. That's kind of beyond object orientated, really. How many minutes have I got left? One. One minute. That's perfect. So, uh, so this explains the proprietal, proprietal control and access system act, patriarchal domination of our bodies and psyches and sociality. And the, in the way, this is the stuff we've been working with for years. Uh, as a kind of grassroots group, which we've, we, you know, that's just normal for us. It's not something that we've suddenly, you know, told the Arts Council about. And, and so, 
<laughs> and suddenly, oh yes. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, there we go. And this is kind of like talks about some of the stuff we're involved in, blockchain cultures. Uh, we were rethinking uh, the blockchain as well. So it's very much about uh, with our act of curation, you're breaking down the hierarchy of curation as well as the hierarchy of use of technology. And it's much more further explained in the writing in, in the book itself. There we go. There you go, I like the kind of sound. Terrible sound. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies for that. I should be like public image. <laughs> I'm just not as cool as you, Mark. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Um, what I didn't do was introduce Mark, so I apologise, Mark, for oh, not sorry. giving you your proper introduction, but I will do it for a reenie if you don't mind. <laughs> I'm going to do it for a reenie. <laughs> that is classic. <laughs> I'm going to get back on, on track here. So Irina Papadimitri is going to do our next talk. She's a curator, producer and cultural manager working at the forefront of digital culture. I'm saying all this stuff because she won't, basically. Um, as digital programs manager um, at the Victorian Albert Museum, which is what her chapter is about in the book, she initiated and was responsible for programs such as the annual Des Digital Design Weekend, and Digital Futures, amongst other projects. She was also head of New Media Arts Development at Waterman's Gallery, exploring digital culture from critical perspectives to her programme. Um, and in October 2018, Irene moved to the position of creative director at Future Everything, and her chapter is entitled The Making of Digital Futures. Irene, Thank hold you. on, I have to press start. Thank you, Susie, and right. everyone. Um, so... Yeah, so my, my chapter was kind of um, started like as a journey, like from setting up the digital programs at the VNA, which was in 2007, 2007 uh, with uh, a few colleagues um, back then. And um, it was kind of uh, going back to uh, a personal crisis as well in terms of like working in, in a big arts institution, in a museum. What was my role as a curator, but also what was, what was the role of the art institution in, the, in kind of contemporary kind of society and culture? And um, so, so a lot of the work of the, and the purpose for digital programs and the events that were happening back then was to... Um, try and uh, I guess yeah the idea of the of hacker culture was very much to kind of how do you uh, insert in a big traditional institution um, the voices of people who are not represented there but also how do you um, go beyond the museum walls in a way um, and also how do you engage in conversations about like when the museum started like year, a few years later to collect objects like this, uh, which is for me, it's like looking at design for surveillance, for example, like, and, and there are so many questions in terms of, you know, how do we uh, engage in conversations and bring in uh, um, creative practitioners, but also people from different backgrounds to talk about um, how technology has an impact in our society and culture today, but also uh, what is the role of art. Um, so, so just just briefly to go through some of the uh, events that I started there. It was mainly, I was trying to use, to create platforms to enable these ideas to happen, like Digital Futures and Digital Design Weekend, like Susie mentioned, which was pretty much like, you know, just creating open spaces to talk about, for example, data or like surveillance culture or talking about a digital identity or, the, you know, how we engage with and with the city, with environment, with uh, ourselves, with etc. In um, in current society, what are the challenges that we're facing, etc. Um, but also, it was uh, as I mentioned before, it was actually how do you break out of the wall of the museum and going in the institution and going outside and engage with the public realm. With the, what do we mean? How, how the institution, if it's a publicly funded institution. Uh, what is its role in so within society and so so it was very much about like creating a platform called digital futures to um that was quite um peripatetic and mobile and going outside the museum for example we did events with in collaboration with uh, organizations and also communities in uh, Mexico City, in uh, in India, in Indonesia, in South Africa, and like tried to create dialogues between different places and think about you know common uh, uh, like challenges and uh, ideas um, and try to to try to think to look at different approaches and learn from each other in a way. Um, 
so this was like this was from a project around uh, e-waste uh, that was initiated by Danny Plogger actually, and uh, we did a series of like workshops uh, with people from China, from uh, Nigeria, and like the UK, and tried to have conversations about. Um, electronic waste, especially if we were talking about technology, we thought it was something that we had to talk about. And just like, um, the just wanted to share this. I, I can't remember if I mentioned this in the book, which is a bit like, uh, maybe it's a bit cheeky, but <laughs> it's, a, it's, um, it's a map and project that um, Vladan Yoller with Kate Crawford from the AI Now Institute put together um, in 2018. And it's a really interesting uh, map of uh, trying to explore the anatomy of an AI system, in this case, uh, Amazon Alexa, and to to look at all the different layers that we don't see uh, behind that. So from the unseen labor to kind of, uh, you know, the um, the, the uh, conflict minerals, but also e-waste, uh, obsolescence, etc. But data as well, privacy, and it it was it's it's a really it started. We had this. Um, at the VNA uh, in an exhibition that I curated in a small display actually uh, in 2018, and now it's it was just acquired by the collection, which is which is great. Uh, but you can find it online. There is also uh, a downloadable uh, document that kind of analyzes all of this. And um, I don't know how much time I've got. 30 seconds. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> but also, so I just put this because it was like some historical kind of documents that again it's to look at the. Um, engaging with the museum and engaging with history and how we go back and repeat things, for example, in terms of like artificial intelligence, uh, you know, bias or like in terms of like facial recognition and kind of... Ooh. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Say Hardcore. Hardcore. Uh, okay. So... Thank you. We, are, we will have time for, for, for kind of <laughs> questions and stuff, so I, I, you know, don't feel like I'm rushing them off too, too quickly. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce Hannah as well, just to rub salt into the wound. Mark. While she's down there, Hannah redler Hawes is an independent curator, producer, specialising in contemporary art, new media and participation. She works with researchers from across... <laughs> We're very slick here. From across the arts, sciences and technology and emerging fields to develop projects that explore shared interests, diversion and conversation between disciplines for broad audiences in galleries, museums and private organisations as well as digital spaces. Hannah wrote the chapter The Evolution of the ODI Data as Culture Art Programme co-written with Julie Freeman who's here. Thanks very much. So um, the ODI began in 2012. In fact, welcome to the ODI. This is this is us, and we're an independent, not non-profit, and um, non-partisan organisation with a vision to help people, organisations, and communities use data to make better decisions and be protected from any harmful impacts. And our Data as Culture program was one of the first art programs in the world, we think, to focus on the material qualities and the social and cultural impacts and structures of data through art, very much influenced by Julie Freeman, uh, the founding artist of the program, whose work is shown here. And all the works I'm showing are kind of just a bit of a showcase. They don't directly relate to everything I'm going to say. It's more tangential. Um, so our program exists here within an innovation company to form and ask new questions, to create a visually and um, intellectually stimulating and rich environment. And our, our projects help us to realize some of the more abstract qualities of data. Um, a lot of the artists and works we work with critically problematize conversations around the opportunities and concerns that data presents, such as construction, navigation, dissemination of new forms of knowledge, data ethics, um, privacy, trust and sharing, and the balance between transparency and all of those things. Uh, crucially, for um, a constantly learning innovation company, we feel that the Data as Culture program helps to shape and influence our culture. Um, it's continually challenging our established order, literally, as we have quite frequently changing exhibitions. So staff who work here will experience a, a qu quite a variety of different artworks throughout their working life here. Um, we engage with quite a lot of new and unexpected and diverse audiences. We've had thousands of people visit the exhibitions here and with partner organisations. Probably millions have been exposed to the work through broadcast and social media. And we like to think that, well, we know from feedback that staff feel valued by an organisation that brings artists to work alongside them and puts up museum standard uh, quality work on the walls. 
So we get a lot of active engagement from staff, and that's really, really important to the program. Um, we get a lot of provocative debate. Um, we get a lot of issues raised. And particular issues that come up a lot are around censorship, online behavior, and the political and social and cultural ramifications of data. But what we don't do is bring the art into the office just to achieve consensus. So the degree of disruption and uh, discomfort that can occur is part of the process for us, the staff, artists, and other collaborators that we work with. Um, and I suppose there's a sense um, some of the other feedback we've had from staff is having this kind of creative disruption helps people to sort of get into a mindset where it's not the natural thing to gravitate towards the most obvious solutions all the time. Um, but it is really different bringing art into a working environment uh, than sending it into a cultural destination where visitors are free to move around and make choices about what they do and don't want to look at. In a working environment, staff don't always have a choice of where they can work or how proximate they are to an artwork. And when you live with an artwork, you form really deeply personal readings of it. Um, and they can be very intimate, they can be very intense, and they can produce some uncomfortable reactions. What's been really challenging and, and interesting for me and Julie is how we legislate for the breadth of visual and emotional triggers, because some relate to societal issues and some relate to very, very personal concerns. And we have to always be able to respond to that. But those challenges, as well as criticism we get from staff, help shape, our pr shape the program and also the way we talk about the works and which interpretation strategies we build around them. I think it's nice to know that artists are proud to be part of our story. They really appreciate contributing to a project led by leading lights like Nigel Shabbolt and Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and they're very generous in understanding that we don't have a white box gallery environment and that creates new forms of relationships. Um, I think, seeing as I had one minute, I might just jump to the fact that our ongoing aim is to ensure that um, dominant narratives are continually challenged and that the open data future is inclusive and representative of a wide range of citizens' issues and views. Yay. <laughs> Fantastic. Can I just ask for a round of applause for the three conversations? Now, I'm sure that your appetite has been whetted and you will have noticed that there's a sheet on your chair. Um, the, the book is available online and in various different bookshops, but with this um, sheet of paper, you've got a code that gives you 20% off. So just to let you know before we go into questions. Um, so thank you, first and foremost, to the three of you. Um, oh, sorry. There we go. Um, so we have, we have about maybe 25 minutes to have um, some questions. Um, if anybody does want to have a question, uh, please just raise your hand and we'll get the mic to you. Um, we're streaming this, so it may not sound like the microphone is working for the room, but it will be working for the people who are, who are tuning in online. So if you don't mind just you know, having it to your mouth while you do ask your questions. I have a question to start off, if that's okay. So while you all get ready to put your hands up. Um, the thing that really struck me when I was preparing for this panel um, was just the, the kind of really different context that the three of you work in and the kinds of audiences that are really radically quite different that you engage through your programmes. So I suppose one of the questions that I have just to kick us off is around context and the role of context in your practices. Does anybody want to kick off? Uh, the role of context in our practices. Uh, I think, yeah, context is a really important thing because uh, it's so missing in the world that we live in right now regarding fake news. And what's so nice when you meet everyday people and have proper discussions about uh, kind of mutual cultures is that you can share context and the meaning of what context actually can create with that meeting. And so I think uh, for us, before we moved to Finsbury Park, we were in a warehouse space which looked pretty cool and all that kind of stuff. And then we went to the park and we thought, oh my God, to meet real people. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then actually what happens, that context of what Furtherfield was uh, changed quite dramatically because we, we've, we've always had a community online and we've always had a kind of media art audience, but then we had a completely different audience that completely mutated in a sense what our... Uh, situation was so in a sense I think 
what re in regard to context, it's actually the audiences themselves mm. in our locality that's com completely made us change. We're no longer kind of like seen as a a media art organisation, although we do codes, we've done all kinds of stuff ourselves, and yeah. there's a high percentage, maybe 70% of it, in, the, in a show which is hybrid, is technology. But in what's happened is that the themes have become much more important, mm. so that the, the exhibitions become much more uh, 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 grounded in the sense that the, the communities that come to the shows, they're having their ideas and their lives reflected in the work. And that's the context that we're kind of trying to improve all the time. Yeah. And I really, I think, I think for you, what's interesting from your chapter is that obviously you're trying to kind of infiltrate and reimagine a traditional museum space with your kind of, um, with your kind of approach mm -hmm. to your programming. So w were there kind of particular challenges or like what, what, what were the things that you had to kind of really put your he head against in order to kind of make some change yeah, in that space? Well, the also, the major yeah, obviously, the majority of people didn't know that the VNA already engaged with um, computer arts, for example, and digital culture. There, there is a big collection of uh, computer arts from the uh, um, early '60s. Actually, there are a few works from late '50s as well. And um, but also, it was to um, it, it was quite challenging to think about like what do we mean, for example, by digital and how uh, how artists might be engaging with different with technology in their work, it without necessarily um, you know showing um, work on screens, for example. It, it's, so it was also about the physicality of mm -hmm. uh, of technology, and it was very much about that as well, because just to challenge this idea that. Um, also, the internet, like data, it's it's very much physical as well, and it's you know uh, like occupying space in our, you know, in our environment, yeah. in uh, on the planet, etc. So, so yeah, it was that was one definitely one one talent and uh, something really interesting to have conversations at the Vienna. But also, it was about like going outside the museum as well, and because of course, you know, we had a very specific audience. Of it, it did change over the years. But uh, it, it's also like how do you enge engage with people outside as well that and it was so that was the whole point of digital futures we had to, we, I was able to do events at universities but also on the street as well and um, I even in like um, we, we came to we, we did some events in this area like in the silicon roundabout they call it I think <laughs> so, so so yeah to engage with the industry as well so it was very much about bringing different people together mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And obviously the ODI is a, is a kind of multidisciplinary research-led office space, essentially. And that kind of brings a whole different kind of context to the kind of work that you're trying to bring into the space. And you've talked a little bit about, I suppose, the realities of living with artworks in an office space in a way that you wouldn't usually. Um, you know, is there any other kind of, I don't know, realities that people wouldn't necessarily consider if you're because it, it's very different to a gallery space when you kind of go in you meditate you observe you kind of contemplate and kind of you know have your own thoughts and then you leave and you don't have to engage with it again yeah so it's i mean one thing that i didn't say is it's part of our public engagement program so although we sort of have several publics there's the publics of the people who work here and i've talked about that and then this room is a room that's used for training thousands and thousands of people from governmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, charity, public sector, corporates. All of those people have access to seeing the art. And those are people who may or may not go to um, an art, certainly not a media art exhibition, if you see what I mean. But we also use the program to go out. So it's about going out into new contexts. So one of the exhibits that's part of the Copy That exhibition outside that I hope you'll all stay to uh, join the launch for it shortly is called Mood Pinball. And that's a project that we did as part of a University of Southampton research project called Data Stories. And we were asked as Data as Culture to uh, think about something that would be meaningful to a, a community. And what we didn't want to do is come up with some marvelous data experience that told a community what data mattered to them. So it was like, we want to go out and find a community who isn't normally thought of as the sort of the, the same old, same old data people. 
So we approached BOM, um, Birmingham Open Media, which is an arts and uh, tech cultural organization in Birmingham. And um, they have a very strong relationship with the local um, neurodiverse communities. So they did an open call for neurodiverse adults in the region to come and join us in a research program to explore data that mattered to them. And to cut a very long story short, we ended up with Mood Pinball, which shows you a non-hierarchical um, experience taking one particular um, uh, autistic person, E.D. Joe Murray, one of the participating artists, experience of the city, and presenting data in a non-hierarchical manner that matters to her, which is sound data. Um, first of all, the fact it was non-hierarchical was completely um, came out of the workshops that a lot of the autistic uh, people we sp spoke to said, when you think of tabular data, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. I just don't see hierarchies in the same way as you. So this was the artist's response. And secondly, um, we actually had to synthesize the sound data because guess what? There isn't any that's easily accessible for people who might want to know about noise in the city. So that says a bit. It does. I'm going to throw, throw it open to the audience. Has anyone got any burning questions that they're dying to get off their chest at this stage? Fantastic. Hello, I'm Berenice. I'm a journalist with verdict.co.uk and I write a lot about how artists use technology. And I was just wondering whether digital art is still a standalone genre or whether it's just become a medium that artists can add to their toolbox? Great question. I'm going to throw it over to the panel. <laughs> uh, it's a good question because uh, there was a time when, uh, uh, as in the beginning of the internet, uh, loads of artists were going on the internet and created net art and networked art, etc. And then you got post internet no one knows what the hell that is and uh and it's kind of a genre from new york really and but basically the, the, the what we've experienced in the gallery and in the park is that it's there's much more uh there's an assumption that the public doesn't know what technology is and actually they do because they use it every day in their offices and their phones and things like that and so but if you so if you make art uh, uh, that relates to their tools of technology that they use every day, uh, then, and uh, then there's, it's, you're halfway there, and then that becomes a kind of much more of a uh, uh, less of an issue that stands out. And in a way, the, the the title of media art becomes less specific if you don't want it to be specific. But sometimes, if you want to be specific, there's places like Ars Electronica and different big places that are much more technical, you know. Yeah, I'd say that it's eroding as a term, but what we're seeing is when we all started working with media art, it was distinguished as being something that the major institutions weren't interested in and that the major structures of the art world and the art market weren't interested in. What we're seeing now is that younger artists who've grown up with these tools, it's part of that it's not different. So it's uh, using technology is absolutely ubiquitous in art making but there are still some attempts to cause divisions between people who are identified as following the media art trajectory and people who are identified as coming in the conceptual contemporary art trajectory uh, which feels su pretty superfluous to me so supercilious maybe but uh, yeah it, it's I, agree. I mean you yeah. could name some people <laughs> <laughs> let's not do that work <laughs> No, I think you. I think you covered it. But it was it just just to say that it's also I think the context of like maybe uh, education and institutions that still create maybe this yeah. kind of you know different separated areas maybe. <laughs> I think from my side of things, I think from my side of things, what's interesting, and I think ODI and um, I think all all of you actually represent this kind of um, this blurring of boundaries um, between I suppose critical art practice that uses technologies and maybe the more commercial end of technologies. Um, and I suppose from my side of things, I, what I would be interested in, uh, you know, in terms of your role, I suppose, as the curatorial broker often in those spaces, like how do you build that trust and those relationships when, you're got, when you've got kind of partners coming from quite different perspectives and use very different kinds of working practices together and, and form kind of I suppose, equitable relationships, you know what I mean? How do you mediate those kind of sometimes... Trust with who? 
-hmm. between the partners, between the artist and um, and kind of potential collaborators that are coming from a different space, a different a different world, but also I suppose you know between those audiences that come in and experience those those projects that you're working on. Uh, okay, I've, uh, <coughs> I think uh, 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 building trust is a really important uh, thing because I think uh, if you if you have an audience that grows with you and adapts with you and lives with you, the same as the artist, then you've got a movement or a culture that that's you're part of. Yeah. And that's where what we feel we've... we've in, in a way, there is a separation between media art world and the art world, traditional mainstream art world, which is basically, uh, if, if we're talking about the markets of the art world. And then, uh, then we've got the kind of media art world that's much more based around post-situationist activists kind of stuff mm. where they're exploring social engagement in a, in a, in a, in a kind of one to ten radicalism some of it more community based some of it activist mm. and so uh, and, and the spirit of say media art comes from fluxus situationist hacking you know so it, and, and also you've got the grey hats hackers the white ha hackers and the black hackers traditionally from the 60s and 70s, which we all know about as artists, but we also use technology as well. So there's this kind of weird thing. So we've grown with this kind of culture where, and we've all survived mutually because the art world has ignored us for many years <laughs> and they're assholes. And, <laughs> and basically what we've done is build Don't our own afraid. culture. Don't be afraid to say how you and feel. And we've built our own <laughs> culture on our own terms. And now people want to know what we've been up to and we're moving into the art world and it's much more relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> you want to? I don't know what to say. Um, I didn't mean to say that. Any more questions? No, no, I no, I think it's true. It's just really interesting seeing cultures collapse. I think what's a really nice um, outcome of network culture is a collapse between disciplines yeah. that's bleeding into all practice and I think that your book Art Hack Practice picks up on that and I, one of the noticeable things about all the contributors, not just us, we're, we're three contributors, how many have you got? 25? 25? Yeah. Um, is people who are trying to restructure the processes and practice of making and curating and creating space where people encounter culture. Um, yeah. Just yeah. say one more thing. I, th I think the other element of this is is infrastructure and so and permaculture and systems thinking, which yeah. we all relate to, and it's something that questions the process of hierarchy. Not yeah. necessary just because you want to be uh, uh, against, you know, domination from above or whatever, but actually it's part of the process of making the artwork as well. So you actually dealing with the material of it and you it makes you have much more control over the the uh, uh, the circumstance of the, the artwork that you're doing and network thinking also does that you're thinking beyond the object and you're thinking beyond the self and so there's a lot of interesting elements that say a lot of contemporary fine art is discovering on its own terms but in a much more physical way which is quite interesting like recent art monthly it's really exploring that, especially around care, systems of care, which is obviously really relevant right now. Mm. So, you know. Really good. Are there any more questions? Fantastic. Do you want to grab them? I, I just wanted to pick up on that, uh, the notion of trust. I think it's really interesting at the moment in, the, in a media landscape where trust is really uh, almost vaporized I mean no one really trusts anything and I wonder if um, the, the trust then flips back to the artists and the hackers because they seem to be more maybe authentic or genuine in the, their use and exposure of technology and I wondered what you thought about, about that how much we can trust the artists versus people that are using technology for other purposes I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question directly but for me one thing that is quite interesting and it's something that I, I feel that I've been kind of having like for the past few years is this 
you know, idea of, uh, yeah, this, the anxiety of like being part of like, the, you know, or like of this world that we don't know what is kind of trustworthy or not. But, and, um, and I feel that is something that many artists kind of explore as well through their practice in terms of like, you know, this constant kind of state of, um, uh, yeah, just uh, questioning things and kind of thinking like, okay, um, uh, yeah, this fluidity and um, uh, and maybe, yeah, an anxiety in which kind of gives you, I guess, the... Um, it gives you the, um, the 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 possibility, or like it it gives you something to say that okay, I I need to kind of you know um, explore that or fight back if that makes sense. <laughs> I don't know if that uh, makes well, sense. I've, I've, what's interesting about artists' roles uh, around technology is that when Ukraine was attacked by the Russians a few years ago, Putin was working with an artist. Uh, to disrupt uh, social systems, and uh, and that, that's called avant-garde politics. And now you've got Cummings and Steve Banning and people like that. They're exploiting artists' ideas to disrupt and introduce new forms of fascism. And so, and so, in a sense, yes, yes and no. We do need artists, but in a way, artists also have contributed uh, unknowingly as activists to a whole right-wing movement like the alt-right and the Pepe movement and stuff like that, So, and the 4chan, etc. So, yes, so in a way, it's about tr artists now having to, who use technology, have to reevaluate uh, if they can trust themselves as well as trust other people regarding their own practice and whether they... It's a funny word, authenticity. Uh, you, you know, I don't think any punk would use that. And, <laughs> I'd, and, I'd, and, I'd, and so I'm, I'm very punk, so... And, and I just think that, that generally, if we can find another relationship with the word authenticity or truth or whatever that is, I think we need to find it and I think we will. I think from my side of things, what's interesting about that question is the, I suppose, the, the role of artists from my perspective um, in, in, in the world of technology and how it's kind of shaping the society that we're living in. Um, seems to be a critical one. So they're questioning, you know, they're asking those, you know, those kind of difficult questions. They're highlighting in various different ways, either from the inside or from a peripheral perspective or looking from a distance. The, you know, the, those inequalities, those issues and challenges that pervasive technologies are kind of throwing up constantly do you know what I mean um, and I think from my side of things what that offers people in a world where everything is black boxed everything is slick everything is you know hidden away and technology is a magical thing that you ask for what you need and it gives you what it thinks you should have um, you know it's those artists and their criticality and their questioning that is, is, is the important thing do you know what I mean and it's about offering a different solution or a different an alternative to what we're being told maybe by more mainstream people with alternative agendas. And I think that's really interesting. And I think that the people, certainly the chapters in, in the book really respond to that and relate to that in terms of the different kinds of strategies that people are employing in that space. Um, so we've got about four minutes left. I'm hot on the time, Hannah, you'll be glad to hear. <laughs> is, there, is there a last question that we can throw out to the room? Fantastic. We might be able to yeah, we possibly can. Um, I'm just interested uh, for audiences what the benefits of art hack practices are. Are they making? Uh, will they notice any differences? Um, well, I don't know if like. Uh, for the whole, I mean, there are so dif so many different perspectives yeah. and approaches in in the book. But I, I guess it's like what was I think uh, Hannah mentioned that before is like how um, uh, we, you know, as curators or like arts, um, you know, organizations, etc., or communities, we explore different ways always to uh, to approach uh, this and uh, and again to uh, create spaces that are. Uh, safe spaces for people to voice their different uh, views and to engage like in critical conversations, I guess, and have this exchange. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I think um, something you wrote in your chapter about was how the projects that you did in V&A um, really surprised visitors. And I, what, one of the things with um, sort of hacker labs and maker spaces is that it can be really alienating. I'm really sophisticated in this field and I find them quite frightening. I'm not a coder and I see lots of people heads down in their laptop and they've all got junk everywhere and I think... I don't know what to do with that, and I don't want to, quite frankly. Um, but 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 I like the way that you came up with some processes in the V&A. I think it was through the Power of Making exhibition. For example, yeah, Ellie Harrison's quilt. What was the title? Uh, yeah, it was with Ellie Harrison, but also it was... I- yes, it was kind of using, for example, like um, stitching or like... Um, uh, sewing or just things that you know are very traditional and uh, that could in- enge- could enable people to come through these spaces via like other practices or ways of think of knowing and uh, and how and it was quite uh, yeah it was kind of opening making sure that it was open to everyone and because I I, I'm the same, like I never, I don't come from like a technology background and I do find hack events and like uh, <laughs> and um, hackathons, etc. are quite uh, scary as well, but it was how we could uh, recreate or like even hack the hackathon mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to engage with people who had never been or they didn't want to go. To, we didn't even call them like that. So, yeah. Can I just mention, uh, so what we've been doing more recently is uh, kind of trying to do what we say and so one of them is that we want to break down curation the hierarchy of curation so what we've been doing is inviting uh, people that live in the area of Finsbury Park uh, to come and co-curate some of the exhibitions and so they introduce their ideas and uh, so we and 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 what happens is that the, the, the exhibition itself and the, and the meaning of the exhibition can mutate and change. And, in a way, and what happens, though, those local people bring their audiences because they want to share what they've produced with us. And so, and in a way, that's kind of what we've been trying, testing that out and seeing what that looks like. And just finally, can I just answer that? So I think from my side of things, um, in terms of in terms of the book, what well, like it's it's really quite um, broad in its spectrum. So we've kind of brought together not just a Western um, kind of global North perspective on this. You know, we've kind of reached out to colleagues in in South Africa, in Mexico, where actually innovation and particularly making means really quite you know something quite different. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, really, absolutely. That's you know, a really good one. exactly. So, so there's kind of there's there's a whole range of di- you know there's Afrofuturism. There's a whole raft of different kinds of ways that artists who um, artists and curators who are fluent in the language of technology and kind of really understand the ideologies and particularly for making it's very collaborative. You know, it's very open. You know, it's kind of rooted in these kinds of characteristics that I think a lot of the um, a lot of the curators and the artists who are represented in the book, um, you know, utilize in order to kind of debunk a lot of, I suppose, a lot of the opaqueness around technologies. So um, Yasmin Grimm, for example, worked with a colleague in Palestine um, to bring 3D printing into a community of traditional craft makers um, who actually had genuine fears about the fact that their craft and their heritage is going to be taken over by these new kinds of technologies. And by bringing these 3D printers in, you know, and, and kind of showing them the functionality about how to use them and the realities of them, they were able to say, Jesus, you know, I make, tw- you know, 200 pots in a day. This thing, you need three, three days just to make one. Do you know what I mean? And it was kind of, so it's debunking technologies, but it's also, you know, in a really creative and engaging way that's meaningful for the audiences themselves. You know, how systems work, what technology and the impact of it means to them and their individual lives. And I think it's re- that's really well represented for me in terms of the range of different chapters that we've, we've managed to pull together. Yeah. Can I just mention one thing about what's interesting about some of the African, South yeah. African, uh, and Aboriginal Indigenous cultures exploring technology yeah. and their own <laughs> histories? What's interesting is that you're getting a whole new movement now of auto ethnographic PhDs being written by South African and also uh, Ab- Australian Aboriginal uh, people. 
and and they're connecting up to like new networks of technology and grassroots culture, and they're able to expand beyond their own locality now and also get their own narratives uh, heard uh, beyond their own towns and stuff like that. And that's a really exciting mm. thing that's happening. I've noticed, I think the, the last four years, it's become much more serious and it's, it's, it is in the art world, like fur text, etc., and some of the exhibitions, but it's what's so nice about the, the media art side is that uh, they're kind of claiming the technology in a very different way yeah. than, than, say, Western culture has. Yeah. And the stories that are going with them are much more, well, they're amazing. And so, so if you get artists that come up and say, oh, why have you always got to have something social with the arts? You say, well, so you can allow other cultures in. You mm -hmm. know, it's not just about, oh, you're genius or how, you know, it's actually, it's got to be more expansive and they've got to come to us and start telling us. Yeah where they're coming from through their works. Yeah. There was one more question. Yeah. It is a really quick one too. Um, so thank you so much. I, um, I used to teach at uh, New Inc., which is the incubator that the new museum has yeah. in New York, uh, merging different um, disciplines all together. And uh, one of the things that it was most challenging to the artists is how they marketed themselves. Yeah. Uh, because going as a artist who is applying media art or different um, types of technologies and coming to a uh, new spectrum, it's very hard for them to sell themselves. So this question is more a hypothetical. So I know that you use the word intersection, intersection in the terms as you're combining different disciplines together or there are different disciplines that you're referring to. But I am curious to know what you think, whether this is a movement that will become one discipline in the future where the ramifications of where it started, the, the beginnings of it, and the combination of intersection will just melt into one. I can say something, but I'm happy for you guys. Thanks. Um, I suppose from my side of things, um, we live in a complex world with increasingly complex, globally focused pro problems. Um, and you can't approach that kind of an issue or that kind of a reality from a single disciplinary perspective. It's just not possible to get anywhere, basically. Um, however, I don't think that disciplines should be lost because actually the value of interdisciplinarity is based on the depth of expertise that people have within their, within their field and they bring that to the table. I think what's going to increase and certainly I think what we've all been involved in is exploring different modes of collaborations, different strategies that recognise the value uh, and realities of different working practices and agendas on the table. Um, and certainly from my research and my curatorial practice, it's been very much about you know, that, equi that equitable relationship that actually is meaningful for all parties involved because I think until you get to that point real change can't really happen essentially because the, you know if the power is remains imbalanced it will always go one way um, and so I think from my side of things you know our attack practice is about that distributed you know kind of collaborative co-production um, that respects and values difference but catalyzes it in order to just think bigger and I think that's it, I'm being told. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I know that Hannah is absolutely dying to, to, um, to get on to this amazing exhibition and opening it, which I hope you all do stay. But can I just ask for you to give a really warm round of applause for our three amazing contributors. Um, no, Mark Garrett, a really good to meet you. And Hannah reller -Hoss. Thank you so much. That was super fun. Thank you. Okay, and thank you all for coming and for your fantastic questions. All good stuff. Um, this was the book launch for Art Hack Practice. You have a